Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The discussion we're having this evening is organised uh, in conjunction with REBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, and as part of its HomeWise campaign, uh, REBA's Future Homes Commission has recommended a revolution in the scale, quality and uh, funding of home building in Britain, uh, which Roger, uh, Roger Graff, one of the um, uh, panellists today, will be able to talk to you about as a commissioner. Uh, and this is the um, report that they produced um, building the homes and communities that Britain needs. Before I get into the meat of it, I do want to tell you one nice thing about it. It's short. Uh, and it's actually quite easy to read, thanks to the efforts of my colleagues from the RIVA there, Will and Rebecca. And it's actually worth reading. Uh, it's because it does contain the answer to the housing problem. And people may, the politicians are used to saying we have the answer. But we really do have the answer, and the people here who have read the report will see that that is the case. First of all, we have actually found enough money for mortgages and for development. And you'll never guess where we found it. John Bannon, to his great credit, the chair, he found it in local authorities. In local authorities' pension funds, not in the housing budget, in the pension funds. Now, in other parts of the world, and I was in Switzerland yesterday and met the pension fund manager from, from Coots and said, you know, how much of your pension fund is in housing and the housing market? 20%. Ours is three. And it's just crazy. The pension fund managers don't see the housing market as a regular, steady source of income. And that's actually what it can be. You know what they're doing with that money? 180 billion pounds of it? It's in the city. Now, there's a really safe place for it, okay? <laughs> it is costing us 1,200 quid. I think it's, maybe it's more than that, isn't it? It's more than nearly 2,000 pounds each, negatively at the moment, to sustain those pension funds in this safe place. Whereas if they put only, all we're asking is 10 billion of that, which can be funded by the big cities, Birmingham and Leeds and, and Bristol uh, and a few others, th that's all we want to kickstart the housing market properly. And again, if you take models in other parts of the world, Holland, Germany, Denmark, and so on, the local authorities have joint ventures with developers. And that's one of the key things we're talking about. The new Localism Act gives these local authorities the powers and the responsibility to produce the title of our talk tonight, Sustainable Development. And part of the research that we did was to discover, and you will also be horrified by this, that of the new home buyers, I mean, that is to say, prospective home buyers, only one in four would even consider a new build. And in Leicestershire, I think it was, they did a ranking of the development of, that was going on in the local authority, actually saw it as their role to assess the quality of development. 56% was regarded as poor. Half the new developments that we're putting up nationally are seen as poor. Another thing we recommended very strongly was to improve the quality of design so that you want to buy one of these houses instead of dreading being forced to because you can't afford any of the other spaces that are around. Thousands of people we uh, consulted in our, using Ipsos Mori and, and other surveys, 60% said natural light was the one, the most important element in choosing a home, and I completely agree with them. And in one of the Ipsos Mori films, which you can see in The Way We Live Now, which is on the website as well, and they published it, here's a new block of flats, purpose-built in Liverpool. Ideal young couple, she's Danish, she's a local lad, but they're you know, very smart. They have two bedrooms, but no storage. So guess what they have to do with their food? The dry goods are in the boot of their car. They have to go and get their laundry done at his mother's, 10 minutes drive away, and the storage of his exercycle, which these days is quite a normal piece of equipment, and the Hoover, is alongside the second bed. 
So if any guest like her mother from Denmark wants to come and stay, she has to climb over the exercycle. And I'm not joking. This is true. In a purpose-built flat, you can only say what purpose do they have in mind other than making money for themselves, squeezing the space, but not in a way that bears any connection to the way we live now. The design responsibility has to be taken seriously by developers and architects and hopefully the consumers because they will in the end be the pressure to improve design. However, there's a key intermediary there and that's the surveyors. And another lot we discovered was that the, the only thing they count are bedrooms because estate agents like bedrooms. So they say, here's a two, lovely two bedroom house. It can be right next door to another two bedroom house that they look the same and be valued the same. One has insulation, sound insulation, more natural light, you know, more, better aspect. They'll be valued the same because they're both two bedroom houses. We are looking at a dysfunctional market in which customers rightly don't want to buy because it's crap. Developers don't want to invest because there's no distinction between good design and bad design in terms of surveying and the value they can then get from the bank. And there's people with the money, like local authorities, would prefer to stash it in the city with the, God knows the kind of risks involved in that, than simply invest in a steady return on income of something like five or six percent, which most people would kill for. So you can see there's a dysfunction in every aspect of this. The last <laughs> thing we wanted to do is make sure that the communities that are built on these principles are places you want to be instead of dreading having them go up next door. Now, the only way that's going to work is if all the agencies and other people who are going to get involved in this, utility companies, the highways agency, uh, people, the churches and uh, other people who are going to build community in elements that will make a place, not just a dormitory town, get involved from the beginning. So as it goes up, it goes up. As, like a tree growing where you can see more and more green as soon as things start to happen instead of the bleak moonscape that at the moment is the reputation of new housing. Thank you. What I found really intriguing as my first bat out there to sustainability is that the economic side, the social side, which I'm so glad this blue book picks up, is for me the next generation of sustainability, the next 10 years, enough of the technology. Uh, I think we're getting almost too obsessed with that and forgetting that economic and social side, which was actually the starting point of our work at Park Hill, which was to strip back and reconsider the entire planning of the place and really think about the lifestyle, the culture, the feeling of space, the social qualities of space, the amenity of the space, before we did anything else. At least 1,000 homes here will actually have great light, full height uh, uh, windows, amazing duplexes, stairs with under storage for prams and buggies and everything for little Johnny to enjoy and uh, a really wonderful feeling of space. We're about to do the same thing again, but completely different because place-specific solutions are so crucial. Uh, the old vinyl factory out in Hayes. It's high-density living, but it's actually high-density living with, I hope, quality complete quality public spaces. Uh, that's going to be the new energy center and powerhouse for the whole thing. Uh, then there's going to be a cinema. Then there's going to be bars and restaurants. There's going to be art galleries, the full works. You know what? We're making a piece of city, uh, a proper mixed use environment. And what's exciting about that is that every single one of those visuals, I hope, looks different and I hope looks like somewhere you might want to go to. Whether you like all the buildings or not is irrelevant. And whether you like the style or not is kind of irrelevant too. Hopefully there's a complete mixture of styles there. Mixture, choice, diversity, absolutely critical to the success of these places. Every home should be built with 2.8 metre ceilings. Come on, let's allow people's brains to breathe. We convinced the developer here to make a two point, even in this tight, tight, tight context, 2.8 meter ceiling height right the way through. So these desperately affordable homes, they're pretty cheap, are right there on the money in terms of light and space and views with these extraordinary huge roof terraces that are open for the whole community to come up and enjoy the spectacular views of, uh, of the Surrey and beyond. Innovation and sustainability, if we're truly working it, needs to be techn technological, sure but also economic and social. Why is the model broken? Because the model is constructed by brokers. Uh, I coined that one this morning. 
banks, developers, agents, local authorities, bottom line, they're all brokers. Discuss, come back to that one. Long-term investment in place is clearly the answer. Roger's revolution is clearly, this book is good. I mean, we've all been there. It's an absolutely delightful Victorian conversion. What are they gonna say about the noughties? It's a really dirty, squeezed, slightly hot, miserable, dark, cramped, don't, it's gonna be a tough sell, huh? So my proposition is that the independent 10 billion pound local housing development fund, which you've initiated and created, which I think is extraordinary, please then, when people are bidding for that, as they unduly will in five, 10 years time when you've sorted it, can we actually demand that there is proven innovation in technolo technological, economic, and social across all of those housing projects. I believe that will be the only thing that would really shift from a culture of housing in a box to proper mixed-use placemaking and proper sustainable communities. The CIH is the professional body um, for people working in housing. Um, and we have in our charter and bylaws um, this wonderful phrase that says that um, our job is to promote the science and art of housing. And I really like that. There are the very technical people who think logically, who think in very technical ways um, about housing, how we develop it, how we structure it, how we bring the finance to it. Um, and then there are the people I call the artists who pour the human all over that. And if I didn't have both sets of people, I don't think we'd be able to do housing the way we should be doing housing. What's been really clear in the last generation, I would say, certainly since I've been working in housing, is this notion that bricks and mortar is not enough. And I think we all accept that now. And the fact that we don't even need to debate it anymore. Nobody thinks about just bricks and mortar. They think about the spaces and the places in which in which those homes are built. We describe the problem quite a bit at the moment as being a supply problem. So there's a crisis in housing supply. Well, of course there is. We're building fewer homes than we have since before World War II. Um, but my mum doesn't really describe it as a supply problem because she looks around, there seems to be housing everywhere. But she does understand that housing has become phenomenally expensive. Housing has the ability to create inequality, but it also has the ability to eradicate inequality. And we have a choice as professionals about which side of um, the fence we want to sit on this one. We know that um, access to housing um, has created huge inequalities um, in the last 10, 15 years. And your ability to access housing now is biased in favour of whether you already have housing wealth. So if people in this room are watching this already have housing wealth, well, then it's far more likely that that's going to increase over time. Um, if you haven't accessed a form of wealth through housing yet, well, then the gap between you um, and everyone else is going to grow. And that's not a good situation for us to be in. And as a housing professional, I don't want that to happen on my watch. We know that already a group of people on very low incomes are going to see that income reduce, all the while, while the cost of housing is increasing because there isn't enough supply, and we face a major time bomb in relation to uh, the future generation um, and how we access housing. And I think for, for landlords, both private and public landlords, they have very difficult decisions to take in relation to what you start to, to do when those very low-income households are unable to pay their rent. And that's going to impact all of us. I worry that social housing has been residualised to the point in which um, it is the, uh, the, uh, potentially an option of last choice and it was never meant to be the case. Um, and in fact, the people I work with who de develop social housing have very, very high ambitions for that form of housing and absolutely understand the impact it makes on the lives of people. So we need to solve the supply issue um, and that's going to take a lot of things and I absolutely accept it's going to take more finance. But the elephant in the room is land. Um, and the release of land and how we do that and doing that quickly. Um, and we need um, some seriously um, more ambitious ideas in relation to that um, at the moment. And we also need to place a much stronger va economic value um, on housing. We hear a lot from government, and in fact the Prime Minister makes all the right noises in relation to housing being part of economic growth. We need to see that. We need to see that in relation to investment. And any, any of you in this room who remember previous recessions and how we emerged from recessions will know that part of that story is a housing boom, and that's what we need. But you cannot have a housing boom without some element of state investment and state intervention. Um, housing management um, is critical to all of this. The bringing together of people in place, managing homes and managing communities is absolutely critical. So I would urge architects 
to think about principles of housing management in the, de in the design of spaces and places. Because when you finish your designs, when you go away from those properties and the people live in them, it's housing managers that make them work. So my job is to bring the architects and the housing managers together. Uh, and I look forward to more working uh, with REBA in the future. Thank you. Participatory processes are not just something you tag on when you've got time uh, and if you're trying to be nice to people, but they're absolutely key both to efficiency and to equality. They're fundamental to building community, which I have come to realize is equivalent to building the social economy of place and not just the market economy. Uh, my preferred definition, people say, well, what is participation? And everyone has their own views. It's about consultation, talking to people, and so on. The one that I like, because it includes all the key words, comes from a guy called Poole. <laughs> Taking responsibility with authority and in partnership with other stakeholders. In other words, it's not voluntary work. It's not just something you do if you've got time. Those stakeholders include invariably, and we've come to realize that, uh, the state, the government, local government authorities, if that's what it is, the civil society groups or third sector organizations, and the private sector. Uh, it's all those together. So how do we make it work? Uh, and I've always used um, my own kind of framework when it comes to our own professional responsibilities as planners and designers, which I call my PEAS process, P-E-A-S. Uh, I wrote a book some uh, years ago called Housing Without Houses, in which I argued that we've got to stop either through the private or public sectors providing housing and instead enable people to provide for themselves. And I've slightly adjusted that because I think to be a good enabler, you also need to be a prudent provider. There's always stuff you provide. It may well be the complete house in many circumstances, but in a lot of the circumstances that I work, it's also sometimes land, sometimes money, skills training, all kinds of uh, opportunities as well, creating that, that foundation for opportunities. The trouble is, uh, when we take the P, we always have, if we take providing on its own, if we just provide, as we were kind of taught to do, uh, one of two things generally happen. First of all, we wind up uh, normalizing things. We try and search for that average family, which is what I was trying to, uh, in the environment that I was trying to uh, engage when I was working for the GLC, that sort of um, standard that is appropriate uh, to everyone in general, but no one in particular. Um, or we wind up uh, with charity. And uh, clearly, we've found in history as now, neither are sustainable. I'm very keen on the idea of design, as I was dealing with in my housing book, design as being a process of enablement. What does design look like if it's a process by which we cultivate choice, open up opportunities for people to engage? What kind of architecture of opportunity, architecture of invitation uh, do we offer people so that they can become partners in that process? The A word in P's is adapt. We recognize that places change. Uh, we try inevitably to resist change because they contravene and they tend to be messy. The question is that most times people improvise through extensions inside the house or outside the house and so on. How do we recognize that change ensures good fit between people and place over time? And if that's the case, how do we make places fit for change? What does that actually mean? How do we encourage it? And the last, clearly, if we look back overall, is the S word, which is how do we sustain it all? Uh, we had a, Roger was reading a very bureaucratic definition of sustainability just before we came in. It was just long and tedious, so I can't help but reflect back on, uh, I think, the best definition that I've ever heard, um, which was from a barber shop, the sustainable barber shop. Uh, and the guy had never, this was in a township in South Africa, and then he thought it was a great marketing technique and so on. So when we went in, we thought we'd find uh, solar powered razors and uh, recycled grey water and a copy of the Brenton report perhaps on his desk or whatever it might be. And of course, there was none of that. So I asked him, what is a sustainable barbershop? And he reflected for a minute and he said, hmm, I've never been asked that before. But you know what? When my, my, when my customers come in, I cut just enough hair so that they're satisfied, but not too much so they come back sooner rather than later. <laughs> uh, and that's the way, that's the, probably the best definition of sustainability that I, I can remember. Thank you very much. <laughs>